Hello, I'm Mark Morgan. I'm co-organising the forthcoming Thalemic Symposium and today I'm interviewing one of the speakers, Alan Chapman. And I started by asking him to tell us a little bit about himself and the kind of magic that he practices. Yeah, I'm Alan Chapman. I will be a speaker at the forthcoming Thalamic Symposium. I'm the author of Advanced Magic for Beginners, The Baptist Head, which I co-authored with Duncan Barford, and uh, the last book I did was Magia, published in 2019. I guess we'll start with that. I have a website called barbarouswords.com where you can find uh, lots of free recordings uh, from my retreats and uh, the content, the spoken content of the, the book I just mentioned, Magia. Okay, so you, you mentioned a thing there called the Baptist Head, which is rather an intriguing reference. Could you say a little bit That's about like that? Well, the, the, the Baptist Head, um, <clears throat> the Baptist Head uh, was a project I started in, was it 2005, 2006, when I met Duncan Barford. We were both members of the IOT, the Illuminates of Tenetoros. That's where we met. I had that curious thing when I met Duncan of... Uh, knowing that i uh, was already familiar with him i don't know if you've ever experienced that where you meet someone and you feel like you already know them uh very curious and um we started doing a lot of practical magic together and a mentor in the iot recommended that i um do the uh, knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel working to pursue that duncan was also interested in that and then we started a uh, little podcast uh, it was me, Duncan, and a friend of ours called Sean. And um, we were trying to come up with names for the podcast. And I'd been reading Grant Morrison's The Invisibles, as one does as a chaos magician. And I just read uh, an issue that featured the Baptist head, which was um, John in the, in the comic, John the Baptist's head, uh, that functioned as an oracular device. So you'd ask it questions and it would churn out an answer. And the idea of a talking head, you know, that's uh, on the subject of magic <laughs> is is the, the rather superficial reason um, I suggested that as a name for the podcast. And that's where the name The Baptist Head came from. Um, Sean would disappear. Me and Duncan would uh, transition from doing a podcast, which there's only a few episodes that we did. They weren't particularly very good. Uh, and we transitioned into a blog where we... Um, recorded all of our different practices that we did, the experiences that we had. We would ask questions, um, display our ignorance for our audience. Uh, <laughs> detail. I, um, I like, I like that. that. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, like, like your like practice. Your practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we would display our, our failings for everyone, <laughs> for everyone to see, um, of which there were many. Uh, but uh, but it was a, it was an adventure. It was an exploration. So we were we were doing this uh, holy guardian angel working. Um, so you could say it was kind of generally thalamic, I suppose. But for for us, and I suppose this is actually the same for Crowley, which I can appreciate in hindsight. Uh, it was the experience that guided um, the adventure, if you like, rather than a specific teaching or a framework. So the words would come after the experience. So we were uh we were doing that that kind of work and seeing what the experience was like but we were also cross-referencing our experiences with other traditions so so at this at the time this is like 2006 2007 um there was a movement called uh, practical dharma i don't know if you've heard of that it was it was started by a guy called daniel ingram and um also with his friend kenneth folk to a certain extent but they were buddhist practitioners from a theravada tradition and um, they were struck by the fact that, that you could go off to Thai monasteries, learn these practices, go through these stages that the teaching describes. But broadly speaking in the West, and it, and it is the same in the East, to be honest, um, but broadly speaking in the West, no one would talk about the results from the practice. Um, and he, so he, he had this phrase which was, which was referring to Western Buddhism as a mushroom culture specifically when it comes to what's described as awakening or these or the fruit of the practice the fruit of doing the, the buddhist practice in in the sense of you know you kept in the dark and fed a lot of shit 
<laughs> right, about the topic. Um, so, uh, so me and Duncan were sort of part of that movement. So there was a there was a forum where people would go on there called the. Um, well, in the end, it was called the Dharma Overground. But the idea was this movement where people would talk about results from practice was part of the Dharma Underground. You see, but then it became Overground when it became public. So for the for the most part, it was Buddhist practitioners, people from um, certain Indian traditions. We were the only magical practitioners who were a part of that Western magical practitioners. Uh, so we so we were looking at the, their their practices, the, the states and stages that their traditions described. Um, and they were doing this, a similar thing. They were looking to see how useful the language was, you know, whether what was described in the traditions was accurate, uh, that kind of a thing, um, and, and exploring it together. Uh, and that had a big, <clears throat> um, I was going to say a big influence, but um, what's the right way of putting it? I think we were just part, we just happened to be part of a certain kind of current or stream that was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and but we weren't also. I mean, in a in a similar sense, though, we also weren't bound particularly by that community in the sense that um, there were some things that, being practical, they for the most part there was the idea didn't really exist when it came to spirituality or realization. And so I'm thinking about phenomena such as th this idea of spiritual transmission, where you can be in physical proximity to a realized human being. And get to participate in their degree of realization, just through the, just through proximity or contact or something like that. And for the for the most part, this idea had been um, ridiculed because you you often found abusive gurus or teachers <laughs> uh, in a community where apparently this was a thing, but you could see absolutely there was corruption involved. So was it all just mind games? You know, was it all just superstition? And being practically minded um people like daniel ingram and um all his view might have softened uh since then um it was it, they for all intents and purposes their experiences of teachers in the Theravada tradition didn't include this phenomenon and it seemed like a silly idea you know like rays coming off a person holy rays that would zap people and that kind of a thing um so it's best to concentrate on the practices that you can actually do you can discuss those as a technical language you know and that kind of a thing but me and Duncan, we thought, well, we'll just check it out and see if it's real. We've heard it's supposed to be real, so that's what we'll do. So there was a there was a guru in uh, visit, visiting in London, a guy called Andrew Cohen. Alan, 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 Alan Cohen. Andrew Cohen. Andrew Cohen. Andrew Cohen. Yeah. Andrew Cohen. So so for him, his like his um, he was well known for this. This is like this is what he does. You go there, you experience transmission, right? And um, we thought, well, we'll just go and see if it's real. We'll just go and see if that's the thing that happens. Now there, there was a there was a lots of it there, <laughs> at this time, um, you know there were lots of weird things going on as, as you know being a magician all kinds of strange things go on all the time. So it was things like uh, I I got a new job in an office, and um, someone started at the same time as me, and I got into conversation with them. And this was the day before I was going to go and check out Andrew Cohen, give this lecture, give this talk. Turned out she was one of his disciples. And she um, she hadn't seen her husband for five years because the sexes were segregated, and she travelled around the world doing menial tasks whilst working basically as slave labour. To um, uh, um, do I have to say allegedly? Do I have to say allegedly, or I mean, I mean, danger, danger of being. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, um, a scurrilous accusation. Yeah, yeah. So we so we went there, and um, and sure enough, so so he's giving a talk, and sure enough. Um, both me and Duncan experienced something, something, um, something extraordinary, something hard to describe. Now, it gets more complicated, you know, uh, because the the on the one hand, I had no um, desire to be a disciple of Andrew Cohen. I already knew that there were things that I didn't like about his personality. Uh, I was also young enough to be to be, um, you know, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> arrogant enough, arrogant enough to think <laughs> he's probably doing it all wrong. <laughs> you know, he's probably doing. I'll see for myself. He's probably doing it wrong. But I think there might be something here. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. Um, I had the curious experience, I should say, um, not to get too sidetracked, that ha having had some some experiences with the Holy Guardian Angel, um, 
a, a curious thing happened during the experience with Andrew Cohen, which is that I recognized the phenomenon as my holy guiding angel. Like, oh, I, I know what this is. I've experienced this before, this kind of spiritual experience, and it's of that nature, um, which points to something a bit more profound than the idea we normally have of, uh, of the holy guiding angel or, or um, even how people might think about the trans transmission phenomenon in that there's there is something that there's there's a shared nature that you can participate in that is um uh available to you as a student is available to the teacher hopefully otherwise why are you there um but also also shared by something else that isn't a human being but is somehow profoundly personally related to you as a person right and that and that there are there are avenues for exploring that that don't require uh, perhaps indulging the naive superficial details that we find in spiritual institutions, whether that be thinking about a holy guardian angel in a certain way or the guru and the student relationship. Does that oh, make yeah. sense? I hope I've been clear so about you're, that. You're in, uh, you it sounds like what you're saying is that you can have a, a teacher, even not a very good teacher, and they can somehow be a vehicle for your holy guardian angel as if the cosmos is actually speaking to you well i would i would say um i think it's i think the situation is probably more shocking than that in the sense that um that uh, the the teacher if if the teacher embodies this nature and you're sharing in it they, they are absolutely aware of that nature What's more shocking, though, is that they can also be corrupt. They can also also be, um, what can we say, uh, getting it the wrong way around and upside down, abusing their position. Just as, the, but by the way, I'll also say this as well, because we often hear about abusive gurus, but the students are just the same. The students are just the same. Why are they there and behaving in that way? You know, what we often don't talk about the students and we think about them as, um, <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well, well the, I mean, the thing about Andrew Cohen that's interesting is that he, he, um, and I think this is where the corruption comes from. Uh, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but he had the worst introduction to awakening you could possibly think of, right? Which didn't help, right? And, he, you know, the it, it's well known in the literature and it's, a, you know, it's a, it's a, for anyone who can bother to look, but, Awakenings or spiritual experiences can often be accompanied by inflation, spiritual mm -hmm. inflation in the sense of um, getting swept up in the enthusiasm and then attaching yourself to what it is that you've realized. And and it's a, it's a very common thing. In Zen, they call it the stink of enlightenment, right? Mm -hmm. It's extraordinarily common. You find this talked about a lot in the practical Dharma movement. Uh, and it's an interesting thing to experience yourself. Uh, and you make a fool of yourself. You you can you you're prone to do that if you don't have the right guidance, <laughs> right? So um, Andrew Cohen had an, has a, had a, had a, his awakening in the presence of a teacher called Papaji in India. It was part of Ramana Maharshi's lineage, and and so what Papaji did was give Andrew Cohen a scroll, right? With with I don't know why, but from the Buddha, all the, they do this is then don't they? From the Buddha, uh, there was a list of all the awakened masters all the way until it got to Andrew Cohen, whose name had been written at the bottom. He gave him the scroll, said to, him, he said to him, he's the one he's been waiting for and he's going to create a revolution amongst the young. Right, so he should go off and do that. That was his introduction at that point to what awakening is. Um, and so I think, and I don't think he really understood w why the awakening had happened, right, what its nature was. And then, he, and then I think he conflated that with some of his psychological peculiarities. And then he would have this strange thing happen to him, which is a thing that no one ever talks about. But he would sit in a room, he would have students, and they'd start to experience the state he was in. Right? But because they're naive to it, it's overwhelming and blissful. Right? For the person that's had this realization, it becomes normalized. Right? They'd, they'd start experiencing this bliss. Now, you can imagine if you were that person sat in a chair and that's happening to students, that's quite a situation to put a human in, in, in the sense of, um, wow, maybe, maybe I am the one who's been sent. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm doing this. Which is human nature, human isn't nature. It? Well, no one ever talks about it because, first of all, you have to admit that there are people who behave in reprehensible ways for whom this is actually still a reality. 
this this degree of realization, right? You can you can talk, you know, obviously Crowley is a great example of this. But but it's enough for people to say Yeah, but but it's it's uh it's enough for people to say, no, you can't behave that way and have this kind of a kind of spiritual realization because if it doesn't look like some kind of ideal left wing politics, <laughs> it can't possibly be it can't possibly be, you know, if it's not peace and light and gentleness and acceptance and and so on and uh what um the the correct term to the the correct type of psychological um uh healthy adjustment to your environment and society then it can't possibly be it but but what if it's possible there's a real thing that's too good to be true it's miraculous we don't want to real it would, first of all we don't want to admit that it's true because it points to a reality that doesn't have a place in our world right uh, and then not only that, but people can be avatars of it who who are uh, don't understand it. They're complete idiots. Um, there's a guy called Peter Kingsley. He's a teacher. In a, in a, in a recent video, he said, "Self-realized people are idiots." <laughs> <And he just, laughs> I think that's a great line to keep in mind. Um, um, from what you're saying, the concept of the holy guardian angel crops up quite a lot in your work is this your main association with Crowley or the thing you take most from his work yeah so so it was always the case even in that um the practical dharma stuff that i knew that it was the western tradition as it relates to Crowley that i was following i always knew that and that's what i was interested in even when i went traveling um after the experiences that me and Duncan uh, recorded in the Baptist head, we ended up doing three books. Um, uh, after that, I went traveling, went and met another guru in India, uh, went all over the place and whatever. But it was always, even when, even when exploring the world and looking at other traditions, it was always with an eye to following this thread. And I'd found this thread in Crowley when, um, well, I mean, the first time I was introduced to Crowley, I was a child. So, so eight or nine years old in the playground, I just I'd realised that that Christ was a one-off. So I went to a Church of England school, right? Human beings couldn't know the nature of God. There was only there was only Christ. Saints didn't exist anymore. Um, and then I start. Then I came across a fantasy novel that talked about magicians and wizards, and I thought that's pretty close. Because uh, because that, that was it. It was mm -hmm. a, a Dragonlance novel. Dragon, Dragon, Dragonlance, Dragonlance, Dragonlance novel. Yeah, um, I mean, ju just by chance, that uh, this kid who lived down the road, um, he he bought a computer game, and this this novel had come with it, and uh, he he thought about whether he knew anyone who read books, and I was the only one that came to mind, so he so he gave it to me, and um, it's the only way I would have gotten the book because I I I um I grew I grew up pretty poor, and there was no way I was you know would have come across it otherwise but as these things happen it arrived at the right time uh identified with the character in the book and then in the playground reading a book of ghost stories i open a page and there's crowley's head you know <laughs> with the serpent around it he's described it as the wickedest man in the world and so on um i was both extraordinarily excited that there was some adult somewhere who'd written this book who thought magic was real right at least to my nine-year-old mind um and the, the curious thing in that novel is that the is that the hero in the novel uh, is possibly being taken over from this evil wizard in the past. His life's been taken over from this evil wizard in the past. And I remember thinking, is there a possibility that Crowley might do that to me? Right. So I so I was I was um, I was both thrilled and appalled though by the stories because it was like torturing <laughs> cats and killing children and all this other stuff. Um, I mostly forgot about that until I was about 15 and then I found magic and theory in practice in a shop. Just happened to have the right change in my pocket to buy this book that cost like two pounds or something like that. It was in an end of end of run publishing outlet kind of thing. It wasn't in a musty uh, magical shop or anything like that. Um, and I bought that and then I spent a couple of years just reading Crowley. So I had that was my introduction to magic. Then I discovered chaos magic a bit later on. Uh, and by the time I joined the IOT, um, I would have said that I was just interested in exploring magic, how magic works, what it is, you know, that kind of a thing. But I always had this background with Crowley, 
and um, when it suggested to do the HGA working, uh, I was familiar with that as an idea. Um, was I thinking about in terms that Crowley thought about it as? I, it's hard to say because I was a teenager, you know, 15, 16, 17, reading Crowley. Uh, that's when I discovered New Aeon, New Aeon Books in Manchester. Are you familiar with that shop? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that, that name rings a bell, but I was yeah, too yeah. scared to talk to anyone. I, oh, would just, oh. I would just sneak in. <laughs> You know, I had a job, a part-time job. I would sneak in, get the latest book, Crowley book that I could get, you know, and then, then I'd be off. Um, but yes, I, I, you know, how much am I going to understand at that age, really? Uh, I grasped some stuff. I don't know, you know. Um, yeah, it was, so with the HGA, he was thinking, I, I'm going to invoke my future magical self. That was one way of thinking about it. And I was thinking, if I have this capacity for magic at this age, and I can do this, right? How how much more powerful would I be in fifty years, sixty years? So I'm 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 going to invoke that future magical self so that I can have that now, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's so uh, it's so ridiculously um, superficial and childish, but that was the thought. So um... <laughs> speaking of <laughs> speaking of um, you know hubris or arrogance, I also thought this. I thought right, knowing what I know of magic. Um, a key thing had dawned on me, which was, if you're going to do some magic, you should really make sure you have an available means of manifestation, right? If there's no way for it to manifest, then then it would be ridiculous to pray every day for the Holy Guardian Angel to appear and expect it to appear in a puff of smoke, right? It's, I just don't think that's going to happen unless you fast and, and perhaps take drugs and then do other things and maybe do that for long enough, then maybe some more. So I thought maybe instead of taking six months, or a year and a half or whatever maybe i can do it quicker than that so uh i did um i put a working together uh a sigil specifically asking for the angel to appear in a vision i think maybe i did that once or twice and then i thought this is taking too long <laughs> so, then, so then i specifically um asked for the angel to contact me in a dream come to oh, me right. in a dream right uh which it promptly did now the stuff in the dream um then dictated the the details in the course of my life up until now so there's stuff that's only just happened that was part of that dream um from then but from that initial contact it was then it, it then continued so that's that's just the beginning it was like an initial vision something like that and then um it provided some details to make the working or the way i was relating to the angel more specific so you know like a name that kind of a thing but then it but then it was you know daily invocation and that went on for in some form or other that's gone on, that's gone on every day you know since then so um th there was then a process of various different kind of mystical states and that kind of a thing coming down the pipeline other visions uh a refinement in the idea of what it is my idea mm. of it would change and does, it's, does it's, 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 uh, I notice a lot of people who are interested in this holy guardian angel thing. When they meet the angel, they always like to have a a name. Uh, it seems particularly important with it. Did you kind of get a name for your angel? Or is it something you can talk about? Well, see, there's a, there's a, there's an interesting dynamic. So, I did get a name, but the name. Um, how can I put this? So at least seven, I think it's seven times I recorded it in the Baptist's head. My idea of the angel changed. It would, it would, um, because I mean, by definition, the leading edge of your practice is the leading edge. It's the most profound thing you've ever experienced. Right. So, so you can have an idea of what that is. But at some point, the, I mean, the, the symbol of the angel itself should be self transcending, I meaning it's going to help you go beyond where you're at. So at some point, it needs destroying and reformulating again. Now, there could be a thread there where the name remains the same. Um, and, and maybe there's a different way of describing it, describing its nature that changes. For me, the way it happened is that I got a name that, that was true in the sense that, that it described a nature that was continuous, but in some senses wasn't its real name, which I, <laughs> which I, which I, which I only knew at the end. You could maybe put it that way. Could only know it at the end. So um, now, in that journey where 
where there was this transforming of the idea of the angel um came that experience with andrew cohen so i had this experience and um i mean and by the way there were people in the practical dharma stuff uh who thought we were we were crazy they just thought it was placebo or something like this i don't think people understand what placebo means most people aren't affected by placebo um and i think they overestimate what the effect is this is not placebo it's something else when you experience transmission uh but anyway it was enough for me to see that and then say ah there's something else to this that's that's not um i've not seen described anywhere and it's not as clear cut as what it's made out to be and there there is something about a living teacher uh a teacher that's what can we say discarnate or um non-human i don't know whatever phrase we want to use yeah and then our own nature as human beings there's something that's shared there and there's something else that's going on to the extent that if you if you focus on one of those superficial details as the as the you know necessary requirement uh you might be mistaken the wood for the trees do you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. um yes no so so right so it got to the end of the baptist head and and um the work that me and Duncan had done sort of came to an end. And for me, the entire magical tradition fell away. <laughs> and, and I wanted to talk about the experience of awakening and non-duality and that kind of a stuff. Um, in the same exploratory, adventurous vein, if you like. Uh, but in an open way, you know, free of baggage and that kind of a thing. Because talking about um, human spirituality or non-duality or whatever, uh, from the perspective of magic seemed especially at the time archaic and unnecessarily elaborate and esoteric and you know that kind of a thing um so i thought maybe that maybe we could speak speak about it in an open in an open ordinary way uh, it turned out you can't do that <laughs> people don't want you to do that it's not a thing that people that people want um so this approach that you had is it something that derived from chaos magic uh, and your involvement in that is that the strongest part of your stuff no it didn't come from chaos magicians the funny thing i mean this is this is what you got to love about chaos magicians right i in 2008 uh there was the colors of chaos event and i gave a talk and basically in a nutshell i mean it wasn't this blunt but in a nutshell i stood on stage and told a room full of chaos magicians that they're all narcissists and the universe doesn't exist just to please them and there was this thing called the great work and, a pat, a pat and all this other stuff and everyone just clapped and cheered and thought it was amazing and just carried on as normal <laughs> there was no nothing changed it was i mean that's chaos magicians for you isn't it um no it was the uh people into non-duality who didn't want me to talk about it who didn't like it those people so the people who are into uh neo advaita um zen buddhists um other people that's specifically interested in that they, they uh, we started a little thing called open enlightenment and we thought we'll just talk about it and it was like no no one wants to talk about it it's not a thing but i um regardless of that i realized that i've you know i've made yet again another error publicly <laughs> <laughs> uh which is fine you know it's all data isn't it it's all information um and we uh so i duncan went off to train to become like a therapist i spent the next 10 years uh teaching so what happened was, as the result of doing the Baptist head, someone contacted me. He was a former Zen priest, and he said, um, "Oh, I'd never experienced Kensho through Zen. Uh, do you think, having read your blog and everything, do you think you could guide me through the same process you went through?" So, so he invited me to to do that. Um, so I said, "Well, I'm sh sure. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not as. Um, what can I say? It's not as uh, heroic." Like the, the effort that's required isn't as heroic as what people like to make out. And it's not as exclusive or as rare as people like to make out. And um, so sure enough, uh, I helped him out and it was just word of mouth. And then I ended up teaching. I spent 10 years trying to um, trying my best teaching. When I say teaching, I mean specifically guiding, helping guide people through the process of waking up. To yeah, the, yeah. the terrain, what they can experience, the practices, that kind of a thing. And um, so I did. So I did that for about, and that's all I did. That was my job, basically. Like, so I would do retreats and that kind of a thing. Did it for like ten years. 
I tried really hard, tried to do my best, explored lots of questions around that whole transmission thing. What's what's the best way of housing this or explaining it? Um, I asked all the questions you could possibly ask. Um, what was I, by leading retreats personally, am I doing something fundamentally at odds with what it is that I profess to be doing? Is there some um, ethical or moral uh, contradiction in doing that? Uh, does it? I don't know if people know this, but um, in the, in this spiritual non-dual enlightenment awakening arena, right? There's, there are book tours, there's a lecture circuit, there's all this stuff. It's like an industry. Um, research, I thought maybe research is the best way of normalizing it and talking about it in a way that isn't as um, exploitative, perhaps, or prone to lead you in, you know, whatever. But research has its own problems. Those people... People involved in research and academia are motivated by the same petty concerns as any other group, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> um, and in the end, I failed. So in the end, I failed. I tried I tried to talk about it in the best way possible. I had a research, I put together a research program. I had an interactive gamified learning platform. I had all this stuff that I, all these videos, all this stuff. Uh, and in the end, it fell apart, completely collapsed. And that was the best that I could do. And then in 2019, um, I, I decided to do a tiny retreat in Greece. Uh, There's a very small number of students. Uh, and I thought, you know what? If I've got nothing to say, I just won't say anything. <laughs> and Greece is pretty nice. And, and it was there that I um, delivered a book. You put it that way. Delivered a yeah, book. Yeah. And that's the Magia content. That's the Magia stuff. Uh, and it was like, so that's the thing that I've been, what can we say? Okay, so you're organising these intensive retreats on a Greek island, which is associated with this book, uh, Magia. Was this the course book for for this, or it somehow emerged in the course of your work there in the retreat? How did that come about? Okay, so I need to, to explain this, right? I have to <laughs> go back to the Baptist head. So after we'd messed about with Andrew Cohen and all that stuff, um, another thing I tried, I thought, I thought, why don't we just talk to the Great White Brotherhood, the AA, right? Why don't we just, why don't we just do that? I've never seen anyone try doing that. So should we just try that, Duncan? And Duncan's like, yes, we'll try that, right? So, <laughs> so we we got into contact with an astral representative of the Great White White Brotherhood, right? Uh, and we did three workings in total. We completely balls it up. We com we made a uh, complete mess of it. So we were asking all these stupid occult questions. You know, like, uh, is is the world run by, like, Satanists? Is there going to be a fake UFO invasion? Whatever. Like, everything you can think of, all of the crap, you know. We were asking all these questions, and, and by the third one, we'd come to realize that um, he was only interested in, the, the contact was only interested in one thing. And it was and it was what we might call awakening, but it's this thread, it's the same thread, it's the same process, it's the same path described by the Holy Garden Angel. And he was interested in us going through that and where it would lead. And that was all he was interested in. And he even gave prophecies. He even gave he even gave uh <laughs> latitude and long longitude coordinates for where I would be when I would make meet this specific person, um, this, this guru in India. Uh before, before I got married and then went on my honeymoon, which was traveling around the world, and I ended up in India in this place. Um, right, so that so with the Baptist head, though, that was the last contact with this, with, it's called Tempe, with this astral representative. Right, now, just before the Greek retreat, so fast forward 10 years, um, I'm sat around and suddenly he turns up, turns up in terms of the vision, right? He turns up, uh, he, made, he made fun of me in a very particular way, which is what he's prone to do. But then told me um, uh, I needed to do something. I needed to do um, it was something to do with the book, right? <laughs> uh, another one, right? Something to do with the book. Um, and it was like, oh, well, what I need to do is I need to get the band back together. I'll go and find Duncan, and we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to him, right? Oh, sorry. So Tempe revealed that his his real nature was the god Ion, Ion with the lion's head. I didn't know anything about this god. Um, but that's who he's supposed to be. Okay, so I went and gate crashed a retreat that Duncan was on. He was doing a casino retreat where you stare at a candle flame 
for 10 hours a day for two weeks until you start seeing crazy visions. And uh, I get crashed that. And to cut a long story short, we did a working where I spoke to Ion and Ion gave a prophecy. And the prophecy was I would reveal a dodecahedron, a secret I'd never told anyone. Right. So I was puzzled by this. And the first thing you do is you try and work out what it might be, which is precisely how you fall from it. But um, tried to work it out right now. Back on, to, on this retreat, um, I started talking and I started saying stuff and three or four talks in. I realized, oh, the six days that will make 12 teachings, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the dodecahedron, the secret I've never told anyone. Oh, so yeah. like that. Yeah. So. Um, uh so you wrote, you wrote it, it there. i spoke it yeah so mm -hmm. i so i so Definitely. i did i um delivered the teachings there so to speak and then i recorded it all uh and that's on my website um and then i knew that i had to put it into book form i knew that there was part of it that i can't change some of it i can change in terms of practical instructions that's fine because stuff doesn't translate in text in the way that it does with audio uh and that became the book the magia book um, so it's so suddenly the thing that I'd left behind 10 years ago is suddenly back. And in it's, and it's, and it comes back in a way where it's far superior than anything I could have come up with, you know, that I was capable of coming up with, uh, in, in the sense of like all of my best, um, theories and ideas and guesses and opinions and strategies, right. Was nothing in comparison. Um, but it was almost like I had to exhaust that and reach the point where 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 the failure was complete and total, and then it could make room for something else that's got nothing oh, to do with perfect. me. That's yeah. amazing. Okay, so we've explored uh, quite a lot of the magical work that you've done and your background. You're speaking at a symposium in a few months' time. Would you like to say a little bit about what sort of ideas you are planning to share then without giving too much away? Well, I um, when when I got the invite, which was a very gracious invite, and I was very surprised to receive the invite. Um, uh, I was asked, uh, was it Seth or Kevin? One of them anyway said to me, oh, would you talk about the Holy Guardian Angel? And bizarrely, I thought, I can't think of anything to say about the Holy Guardian Angel. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, yeah, I'll do, OK, I'll do that. Right. Um, now, since then. I have been working on a Crowley project. So um, uh, my publisher who published advanced magic for beginners back in the day and uh, just did uh the baptist head um oliver he he asked me did i want to do a crowley book and uh, and i i thought i could do one better why don't we do a collected magical works right and and, and edit them and put them in in a you know, present them in a way that's that's clear and, and makes sense about things um and i thought there's a lot of things to say about crowley that's never been said as unbelievable as that sounds <laughs> So um, since I think about February until now, I've, I've just been working on uh, a lot of material to do with Crowley. And, and in the space of doing that, uh, there are some things that I've come to realize about Crowley's um, path, if you like, or, or process, something like that, uh, that no one's ever talked about before. Um, and so it does relate to the Holy Guardian Angel. So I, so I was thinking my content will probably be me presenting uh, my process a bit, a bit like what I've just talked about in this in this uh, call, um, but with methods and that kind of a thing, be a bit more specific. Um, and then what I've then since discovered about Crowley and his process, because the from the outside, if you looked at the Magia stuff, it doesn't look thalemic at all, does it? Um, I don't know if you've had if you've had a chance to look at that stuff, but. Uh, you know, there's a there's a very certain there's a certain aesthetic, isn't there, with Crowley and Thelema, um, and a way of talking about it, and you know, uh, very specific practices and that kind of a thing. Um, but there's something deeper going on, something that's that's. Uh, uh, it'd be great to tell you now, but that will ruin the surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So from what you say, would you identify as uh, one of Crowley's Thelemites or the Thelemic philosophy? Is that something that you is important to your life? I, it's, I have a very personal relationship with Crowley. There's mm. no two ways about it. Um, he was there... He was there at the beginning when I was yeah, a kid, yeah. right? And he and he's still here now. Um, and 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 you know, in in hindsight, um, when I look at my time as a chaos magician, uh, I, I actually think now. I mean, at the time, I would have said I was a, I was a chaos magician then, and not really a thelemite per se, because you can just you know looking at how the different groups operated and what they, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but if you look at Crowley's stuff, they've got even the Golden Dawn, they were doing what Chaos Magicians do. Uh, they, they were getting the best that they had, fragmentary texts, you know, from museums, making it workable into a system, and then just do, some of them, just doing the practice and seeing what happens. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the, and and um, and then what was Crowley doing? You can look at the surface and say, did the Abramelian work in? He didn't do the Abramelian work in. He <laughs> and it was never about. He started well, and, and finished. Well, what I mean is, it was never about having a room, you know, laid out into a certain specific specification, uh, where you pray to Adonai, like you pray to God to send mm. you an angel, uh, etc. Before he even does that, it's like there's there's already this idea of the high genius in the Golden Dawn. There's all these different words. He, he settles on Argoides, doesn't he, for a little while there. Um, and it was it's so what, what I'm saying is the the um, the outside appearance, the exoteric expression, isn't the important isn't isn't the thing that he was doing. The thing that he was doing was something underneath. And um, I mean, for me, I would I would say if you wanted me to say, do I think he did the Abramelian work in per se? I would say, well, actually, it's interesting if you look at the details. He he. <laughs> He does go. He does have contact with his holy guardian angel, and then the first thing he does when he gets back is he evokes demons, Beelzebub, and so on, which is what you're supposed to do. Now it's not within a conscious, intentional Abramelian framework, but the, the structure's there, isn't it? Um, but what? So, so what am I getting at? I'm trying to say that there are many names for this thing that he did, one of which could be Abramelian, uh, but when people think that he he failed because he didn't, you know, follow a rote uh, recipe. Uh, they're mi they're missing the, the the truth of what was happening, what was going on. And I see. So I so this is a long way winded way for me to say. I when I look back now on my trajectory, I feel like I was just doing the same thing. And if I focus on the on the exter externalities, um, then then it might then I might say, oh, well, of course I'm not a thelemite. But uh, now I would say. Now I would do an annoying thing and just say, what do you think Thelma is? Right. What do you think that is? Uh, what do you think he was doing? Um, and then and then I could answer the question. <laughs> this is great. But I, great. Yeah, but I, I mean, I would, I would say this, though. I, I would say that the, um, you know, if I was forced to, if I was forced to put my, you know, stand in a camp somewhere, I'd pro I would probably stand in the Thelemic one. Um, I mean, it's it's my first symposium, yeah, yeah. Uh, of any description, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've I've not had um uh what can I say much contact with the Thelemic culture per se, yeah. um, so so I'm completely naive to to who's speaking and what they're going to talk about, but I mean the whole program looks interesting. I'll be I mean I'll be listening to and taking part in everything that's there, so uh. See what it's see what it's about, um, but yeah, it looks really really. I mean, the one thing I'll say, at least, to, you know, in terms of my own understanding, the symposium hasn't been around for a while, has it? There was a break. There was, there a, was break. a break. There was a break, and the fact that it's returned, right, is um, I, I'm just thrilled to be a part of of it, of it returning, being a part of that, and I think <laughs> that that's uh, um, uh, that's what I'm most excited about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's uh, Alan Chapman, who's speaking at the forthcoming symposium. So it just remains for me to say, 
Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. <laughs>